Good morning. So good to see everybody today. I hope everyone's having a great weekend. If you're visiting with us, we are excited that you've come our way and we invite you to come back and worship with us any time that you may have the opportunity to do so. Before we get started with our lesson this morning, I have an announcement that I want to share with you. Some of you are already somewhat aware of this, uh, but I wanted to give you a little bit more detailed announcement. Some of you are aware that several months back we had a new roof put on the building and in the inspection of everything it was determined that there was quite a lot of water damage to the ceiling here over the auditorium. And in discussing with contractors and with the insurance adjuster, we were essentially told the only way to fix it is to completely tear out and replace the whole ceiling in the auditorium. So what has been determined by our elders as well as by uh, the contractor is that this ceiling that is original to the building has been here for 70 something years and has served its purpose is going to be replaced. Um, the adjuster is afraid that with the amount of water damage that there is, that eventually it could cause some of the tiles to begin to disintegrate or uh, could even have some mold issues eventually come up. And so their recommendation was just upgrade. So on September the 25th, as when the contractor is supposed to begin, there's also some work that's going to be done over here in the education wing. And I believe from speaking with the contractor, he's going to try to get all of that finished first. That way we will be able to get set up and can meet in the small auditorium. Uh, he is anticipating about two weeks on the main auditorium, probably one week over at the side. And so in this process, you know, we may have to do some shuffling around from time to time if uh, if we have a large crowd one week, we may need to go down and meet in the basement if we need a little bit of extra space. But I just wanted to let you know what is coming up. Um, we're excited about this. Um, it's, uh, they're going to take all of the old acoustic tile down and go back up with drywall. And also in the process, all of the walls, trim, everything in here is going to be painted. And we are, we're looking forward to getting this done and... Uh, just seeing some of these upgrades being done so that uh, our facilities here are kept up and maintained and in good working order. And uh, if you have any questions or comments or anything about this, uh, please feel free to speak with Dave and Tom or myself. We'll be glad to uh, share as much information with you about this project as we can. But just keep in mind, as we get toward the end of this month, we will be sharing some additional information, directions, things of that nature, because we will have to shut off certain parts of the building, things like that. Uh, but as of right now, our intention is that we will be meeting in the small auditorium for about three weeks. And if that changes, uh, we will let you know. But as I said, that work is supposed to begin on September the 25th. Last Sunday, we began a study of evangelism. We're using Mark's account of the Great Commission as our main lesson text. And in this introductory lesson, I went back and I shared just kind of a brief history of evangelism and some of the evangelistic tools that our brethren have used in the past and how many of those tools have now been placed into libraries or onto storage room shelves and are no longer being utilized as they should, how many of those tactics have been forgotten, and how evangelism seems to be somewhat of a lost art with many people. There aren't that many people going out and carrying the gospel to the lost as there once was. But we must remember that Jesus said to go ye... Literally, that means go you, you go. The title of these lessons, Go Ye, means go me. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. 
While this initial directive was targeted at the apostles, these were the ones that Jesus was speaking to at this time. These were the ones who were to be these initial evangelists going out and carrying the gospel. But we find that after the institution of the church, there on the day of Pentecost, this became the task of every Christian to go out and to share our faith with those who are in the world, to seek and to save those who are lost. And I discussed last week how when we look at the New Testament, we find at least eight different styles of evangelism. Those being confrontational evangelism, intellectual evangelism, testimonial evangelism, friendship evangelism, invitational evangelism, service-oriented evangelism, nonverbal evangelism, and restorative evangelism. And I mentioned that over the next few weeks, we're going to be spending some time looking at each one of these styles of evangelism in the hopes that it will open our minds to some ways that we can use some of these things. Some ways that we can apply this to our own actions and our own tactics in going out and carrying the gospel to those who are in the world because the hope of each and every one of us, or at least I hope the hope of each and every one of us, is that we want as many people to go to heaven as possible. And we want to help as many people go to heaven as we possibly can. Last week we considered this first style of evangelism, confrontational evangelism. And in this we looked at examples from the lives of Peter, Paul, and Jesus. And we noted that this is a very effective way of reaching the lost by using the gospel to lovingly confront them about the sins that are in their life. Now we also address the fact that there's no guarantee that they're immediately going to listen. There's no guarantee that they're immediately going to change. But we are at least planting that seed in their mind. And then as they go and as they contemplate God's Word, as they contemplate their life and consider the things that are taking place, you know, who knows, at some point in the future, that may lead to repentance. That may lead them to changing. And you may have been the one that planted that initial seed in their heart. Well, today we're going to look at the second style of evangelism. And this is what we're referring to as intellectual evangelism. Now, a great example of this style of evangelism is what we see the Apostle Paul doing in Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 34, when he is there in the city of Athens speaking to the philosophers of the city on Mars Hill. We find in this account that Paul has gone into the city of Athens. He goes to the synagogue first, which was always his tradition. He goes and he begins to teach people there. But then he comes into contact with some of what we might call the deep thinkers of the city. These philosophers. And the text tells us that these were people who had adopted two philosophies. The first being Epicureanism, which is what we commonly today refer to as humanism. You know, the whole concept of, of eat, drink, and be merry. Get the most joy out of this life as you possibly can. And the second being Stoicism. Stoicism simply teaches that by living a good moral life that you can come to have true and lasting happiness without devotion to any type of deity. Meaning you can find purpose in life, you can find joy in life just by being a good person. You don't have to have God. Well, these men, they take Paul... And they go up on the Areopagus, also known as Mars Hill, and they begin to question him. They say, you know, we've been, we've been hearing some things about you. Some, immediately, they dismiss Paul. They say, well, this man's just a babbler. He don't know what he's talking about. But there's others, they recognize that he's sharing things that they've never heard before. But they don't immediately dismiss it. The text says that they recognize that he's speaking about a strange God or a God that was foreign to their thought process, a God they had never heard of before because he's speaking about someone named Jesus. He's speaking about a resurrection that is to come. 
And these men, being the ones that were seen as the highly educated, they're saying, we've not ever heard about this before. And so they want to hear it from Paul. Paul, we're hearing you're talking about all of these things, but we want to hear it from you. Is that not the mentality that we all need to have? When we hear that there is someone that is speaking something that is foreign to us, something that we've never heard before, or maybe even we are confronted with, well, you know, so-and-so, they're teaching this, believing this, or they've engaged in some type of sin, shouldn't we go to that person? Should we not have enough integrity about us to go and find out from them? Well, that's what these men do. They say, Paul, we're hearing all of these things about you. We hear that you're talking about some strange God that we've never heard of before. So tell us about it. We want to hear it from you. Folks, this displays great integrity on their part. They wanted to know exactly what it was that Paul had to say. Well, Paul seizes this opportunity. And notice what he does. He uses their abilities of reason. These individuals were seen as the highly educated, not necessarily because they were smarter than everybody else, but because they had the ability to think, the ability to reason, to consider all of the different aspects of of these subjects being presented and then come to an educated conclusion based upon all of these different facets. So notice what he does. He uses their ability of reason and he lays out a case for the existence of God. But then after doing that, he then lays out a case for the resurrection. He throws that information out there to them. He gives them the facts. But then he leaves it up to them to reason it out to think about it, to come to a conclusion for themselves. Now, of course, not everyone accepted his message. There were some that immediately started mocking Paul, but the text says that there were some who were intrigued. Their interest was piqued by what he had to say, and they said, you know what, we want to talk to you more about this. This is interesting to us. We want to hear a little bit more about what you have to say. You see, that seed had been sown, hadn't it? They weren't sold quite yet. But at least they wanted to hear a little bit more. They were open to studying more. Now, when we speak of intellectual evangelism, folks, I do not mean that this is talking about going out and trying to save those who are smart. Most of the time today, when we hear the words intellect or intellectual, we automatically think of someone who is highly educated. But when you go back and you look at the definition of the term intellect, the most common definition is someone with the capacity for rational thought. Meaning someone who is not going to immediately jump to a conclusion. Now there were some who did that with Paul. There were some who immediately said, you know what, this man's a babbler. We don't need to listen to what he has to say. They immediately jumped to a conclusion with him. These people were not intellectual. They did not have the capacity for rational thought. But you had others say, okay, we'll hear you on this matter. We'll hear what you have to say. And they reasoned those things out in their mind. They were able to consider the validity of the argument. They didn't have to have the answer made for them. You know, so many times I think we fall into a category of wanting someone to decide everything for us. We reach the point where we want someone to tell us what we're supposed to believe. We want someone to tell us how we're supposed to act, what we're supposed to do. We don't want to reason those things out. We don't want to study God's Word and consider it for ourselves just Tell me the answer. And I think we can identify with that. You know, we, we probably all, and I've shared with you before about how when I was in school, one thing that I hated was when I had a teacher who would respond to a question with another question. 
Now, the reason they were doing that was to get you to think critically, to consider, to reason for yourself. I just wanted to know an answer. But is that not the mentality that so many of us end up having? We lose that ability for rational thought. Why? Because we just accept whatever everyone tells us. But that's not what Paul did with those in Athens. He laid out the evidence and he left it up to them. He said, you know what? You people have the ability to determine this for yourself. Here's the facts. Now go home and think about it. Consider these things and come up with an answer for yourself. One writer has presented this style of evangelism. And when I came across this, I thought, you know, this is such an ingenious way of approaching this. But this writer has presented this style of evangelism in the form of four irrefutable spiritual laws. Now you may remember from our study on Wednesday night that we're engaged in on Christian evidences that a law is something that can be irrefutably proven based upon evidence. It's not a theory, it's not an idea, it's not an assumption, it's a proven fact. Now, intellectual evangelism can be presented from the standpoint of four spiritual laws. And these laws can be proven without a shadow of a doubt. So when we think about how we can engage a person's intellectual capabilities with irrefutable fact, fact that people, when they hear it, there's nothing they can do to discount what you're saying because it is backed up by the truth. I think these four spiritual laws, and I'm going to give you four supporting Bible verses to go along with these. I encourage you to write these down if you have a pen and a piece of paper with you or jot these down in uh, the front of your Bible. The first of these spiritual laws is this. God loves you and has a plan for your life. God loves you and has a plan for your life. Now when we consider this law, the first Bible verse that comes to my mind is one that we probably all can quote verbatim. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Now this this verse highlights for us the great love that God has for all of mankind. The desire that He has for our salvation, His willingness that we should not perish, His desire to provide us with everlasting life. Can anybody refute that fact? No. God loves us, doesn't He? God has a desire for our life. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to go to heaven. The second law states that man sins. Man sins, and those sins separate us from God. Therefore, we cannot be saved simply based upon our own merits. Simply put, it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, you cannot get to heaven on your own. Paul's words in Romans 3.23 attest to this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But also, as we see set forth in Isaiah 59 in verse 2, our sins separate us from God. They hide His face from us. And in that sinful state, we're told that He will not hear nor answer our prayers. Brothers and sisters and friends, God can have no fellowship with sin. God can have no fellowship with the works of darkness. Therefore, when we reach that age of accountability and we fall into sin, that sin separates us from our Heavenly Father. And at that point, there is nothing that we can do on our own to restore that relationship with God. Nothing by ourselves that we can do. Which brings us to the third spiritual law. The third spiritual law states that Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sins. The only way that we can have our sins washed away and have that relationship restored back with God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. He hasn't provided another way and He's not going to provide another way. Jesus is the only provision. Paul attests to this in Romans 5 and verse 8, but God commendeth His love toward us 
in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Have you noticed how each one of these laws adds another layer to the one that came before? They're building blocks upon each other, fleshing out this overall concept. God loves us, but we sin. That sin separates us from God, but God has provided His Son to take care of that sin. They all build upon each other, don't they? They're different layers of this overall concept. Is this not what Paul did with the Athenians? Is this not how he presented those arguments for the existence of God and for the future resurrection? Yes. He started out with a very simple concept and he built upon that. He fleshed that out until he presented the whole concept. The fourth spiritual law is the connection of all. Brings us into this complete irrefutable argument. Fourth spiritual law states that salvation is only available through Christ Jesus by placing our faith in Him, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith, and being baptized for the remission of sins. God loves us, but we sin. That sin separates us from God, but God has provided His Son. And the way that we access the blessings of His Son is through the plan of salvation. All of that ties together into these four spiritual laws. Looking at our lesson text, the Great Commission, what did Jesus say? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We look at the repentant Jews on the day of Pentecost when they cried out, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you for the remission of of your sins. So by using these as well as other passages of scripture, we can present and we can defend God's irrefutable plan of salvation. But it all starts with this idea that God loves us. God loves us. And so he has provided all of this for us to make it possible for us to be restored to a right relationship with Him. Now there are numerous advantages to using this type of logic, this type of evangelism. Among the most powerful is the fact that it allows us to biblically defend these facts. We are able to use the gospel of Jesus Christ to promote an irrefutable argument. And by using these four spiritual laws, we're able to present a simple easy to understand, easy to retain way of presenting the plan of salvation to those who are lost. It allows us to break that message down into these little snippets that can easily be built upon. We talk to someone who is lost in sin. Think about how powerful that initial message is that you have a Heavenly Father who loves you. You have a Heavenly Father who loves you. But because of your sin, you're not able to be in a relationship with him right now. But there's good news to refute that bad news. He has sent his son, and by obeying the gospel, you can be saved. Your sins can be washed away, and that relationship can be restored. What a simple way of, of retaining that and being able to present that. But there's also some disadvantages to this. For instance, many of the people that we reach out to with the gospel, they may not believe in God. They may not trust God's word. And so if we approach them with the word of God initially, before we work with them and, and develop within them a trust in God's word, this tactic's probably not going to do much good. If they don't believe that the Bible is God's word, why are they going to listen to the things that are contained therein? To a non-believer, Scripture is merely fiction. To a non-believer, the Bible is just an old, antiquated book. 
something that we really don't have to follow. But when you take someone who does believe in God, you take someone who does trust in the Bible, but maybe they've been misled or maybe they've been misinformed as to the plan of salvation. Folks, this can be an excellent tactic at reaching out to them and sharing the truth of the gospel. We've been using this style of reasoning quite a lot in our Wednesday night class, talking about Christian evidences. For example, those of you who are in the, that class, you'll recognize this argument. There's a universe. That's an irrefutable fact, isn't it? The universe could not have created itself. There must have been a supreme creator. That creator is God. Or there's design in nature. It could not have designed itself. There must have been a supreme designer. That designer is God. So this line of reasoning is something we're familiar with. It's something that we see in many different facets of life. We see this same type of reasoning a couple of places in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4. Notice this verse. It says, For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. Well, let's apply that line of reasoning. A house exists. Someone had to have built that house. A man built that house. But who made man and who made the materials used to build that house? God. You see the reasoning? You see the logic? The rational thought that's used there? You know, we also see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 29 through 30. And, and, you know, a lot of times this is seen as one of the more difficult passages in the Bible to understand. But I want you to notice the reasoning that's used here. He says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? So notice the reasoning that's used here. We're baptized for the remission of our sins. But what if there's no resurrection of the dead? Why be baptized and continue to put your life in jeopardy if there is no resurrection? But there is a resurrection that will take place when Jesus comes again. You see that logic? That same kind of reasoning is used there. So once again, we see that this style of evangelism is not going to be effective with every person. It's not going to be effective with one who does not believe in God, does not trust in the Bible, but it's an excellent tool for developing and expanding the faith of one who is a believer in God, one who does trust in God's Word, and it's an excellent tool for deepening faith and devotion and understanding among those who are striving to do the Lord's will, those who have placed their faith in God and in His Word. Now there may be someone here tonight that this type of evangelism has been able to reach. You think about the reasoning that we used, the information presented in those four spiritual laws, and maybe it has opened your eyes to the reality of a change that needs to be made in your life. Maybe the knowledge that God loves you initially touched your heart, initially got you interested in hearing what the gospel has to say, but then you came to the realization, well, I'm a sinner. My sin has separated me from God. I, I cannot be in a relationship with God in the state that I am now. But then, by the knowledge that God has sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for you, to make possible that plan of salvation, whereby through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, your sins can be washed away and that relationship with God can be restored. Maybe that has caused you to come to a realization that that's an action you need to take today. We would encourage you to do so. Or if you are a child of God and you find that you've strayed from the faith and you've not been living life the way that you should, then we encourage you to repent of your sins. Come forward and, and make your desire known to rededicate your life. Be restored to the faith. Let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf and study with you and encourage you and to help you in getting your life right with God.
This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come at this time while together we stand and sing.